I am a person who admires government very much. I see government in the context of a sacred trust that is the basis for the quality of life, for the continuation of values, for the hopes of future generations. And I see it having been successful, even though we don't always give it credit. I look upon things like social security, highways, railroads, defense, research, water, airports, et cetera. These are government programs that I doubt would have happened had it not been for progressive government in the United States. Other nations who haven't been so fortunate don't have a similar base. A change for me, and I must say that when I started out in a career, I was as about as conservative as you could be politically. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest, and everybody in town was a conservative voter, and so was I. And I worked successfully for corporations, was very competitive. But it, then I wandered around the world alone for a couple of years and saw a great deal that opened my eyes. The dilemmas of other nations that weren't so fortunate to have our free society to have the structure of government that we had, the realization that many of the things I thought wouldn't work were working very well, whether it be socialized medicine or some other themes. So I adjusted a bit, admittedly. And then, having watched and been in government, I realized recently that we are undergoing a remarkable change, remarkable potential change for positive advance into the future. That occurs in part because of information management, computers, the ability to think in seconds, ideas that 20 years ago we didn't think were possible to consider. I remember Rene DeBose, a remarkable, wonderful scientist, said at that time just before he died, he doubted very much that the human mind could even think ecologically before some of these computer programs were available. And so we've had a tremendous advance and that frees us. It allows us to deal factually. It lets us move away from almost the mathematical modeling, the conjecture, the theories, down to getting real and solving the problem. So government is capable of doing that, I would argue. And I think of a personal experience on the importance of information. In those years when I was in Sacramento, we had all the resources of the state that we were to deal with. And one of the most difficult was water, because there was a drought on at the time. And we would sit down in these meetings, and we would glare at each other. The urban policy person would come and sit down. The ag person would come and sit down, and other interests at the table. And it was liar's poker. We all had our database, and we didn't trust the other people's database at all. So we always ended up shouting at each other, and no advance occurred. And nobody it was always theory. It was always mathematical modeling. It was always, I don't know. Recently, I turned on the internet, and there was a water program. Every 20 minutes, information on the key water points in the state, flows and so on, public information, things that we would have dreamed of having back then, and they were just not even thought about. And so all of a sudden, policymakers are able to advance tremendously in that area and a lot of others in ways that I wasn't able to even consider, as, I, excuse me, as they say. Got a problem? Can help yourself. Is that doing it? Thank you. Is that okay? Thank you. Another reason that government is now capable of remarkable advance that we are beginning to take part of, and I believe clearly is going to happen, if we're, if we're to survive, frankly, is the word management. One of the remarkable accomplishments of America as a nation has been the development of management, understanding the dimensions of a problem, structuring it with goals and objectives, and solving it. It might be building a lectern or a factory or a dream, but we're very good at that. And the rest of the world has copied us pretty much. Until recently, government wasn't in a position to do that kind of thinking and that kind of carrying out of actions. The problems we face, California now has 30 million people. I talked to the head of forestry this week in the state, and he, I said, how was your budget last year? He said, geez, we spent 250, we're supposed to, our budget hope was 250 million on fire control. He said, there are now people in every grove of trees in the state. 
to where it's possible to do so. Everybody's dreaming of the retreat. He said, our overrun was 175 million because we we're trying to always protect people's houses all through the forests and, and uh, the problems of dealing with population are, are starting to hit us. And when you look at the world population levels, a very real problem that can't be discounted. It drives terrifying potentials ahead of us. Who will feed China, for instance? For those um, who discount some of these things and the importance of government management, I think in terms of my colleague from Montana, it is said that in the Ohio, Missouri river basins, when you get to New Orleans and have a drink of water, it's been through someone else's stomach six times. And considering all the beer they drink in Bozeman, it may be a major source. I say that positively there when I was there with them. I think another thing we've learned to do is to communicate and educate. 25 years ago, we were not as enlightened as the American public is today. A lot of our educational television improved. I wish I were a student today. The tremendous opportunities to learn more, faster. I would say further, and I've had a personal experience, and a lot of them, I guess, that gives me confidence about government. And what I think of, just to pick one, is salmon. Uh, I enjoy salmon, and when the group of us went into state government, that was many years ago, one of our goals was to double the number of salmon that were available out the Golden Gate, one of 80 programs that we'd actually put together. I've been out several times so far this spring, the last time I went out, I had my limit in 15 minutes of huge, beautiful salmon. We didn't double the number of salmon, we tripled the number of salmon that are available now to fishermen and to the fishery. How did we do that? We came up with the most remarkable breakthrough, cooperation. The idea was that there were a thousand miles of spawning streams that were plugged by poor logging practices of a century earlier. And the appeal was that if we opened those, we would indeed increase the number of salmon available by opening natural systems, not hatcheries, not technologies. And that occurred. And we hope to do it in whatever it was, 60 years. We did it in four or five years. Why did we do it? Because people got in the water and worked it out. School children, bank presidents, volunteers, professionals. It was a remarkable accomplishment of volunteerism, government, and industry coming together tackle a problem and solve it, goals and objectives. I suppose, and there are many other programs that have been very productive there from those years. One is called Ceres. We spent $4 million on a computer software program so that we would be able to have an 800 number so that every water user in the state can call and in your community be told how much water you should use for irrigation that day so that you're not over-irrigating, which is one of the things that brought down the Roman Empire, was too much water, it evaporates, you leave salts, more salts, before long you can't grow anything. And that wiped out the grain belt in North Africa of Rome. And California has 300,000 acres out of production, another 600,000 endangered by this process as we started to turn it around. No individual could have done that. It wasn't an economic theme. It was a process of government serving the future and it's not doing very well. A lot of other programs like it. One of the critics, or the constant complaints, of course, is regulations are damaging to free enterprise or whatever. And uh, while that can be true, part of this progressive change is that we now understand enough that we can solve the problem. And industry, most of all, is moving out in front. Companies like 3M and Hewlett Packard are operating at levels above what the Sierra Club would expect. And this is changing constantly. No longer are we chasing simple economic models of growth. We're understanding that this is a complex condition. California's 30 million people are out of water, very close to being out of air, facing a lot of other problems that can only be solved by a cooperative endeavor sitting down, working it out together. This word cooperation and regulations deserves a further touch. I constantly turn toward several nations in the world 
that have put together a program to totally recover environmental quality, to put environmental threats behind us the way we put smallpox and polio behind us. We're now capable of that. We know enough. We have the ability to do it. And several nations are actually carrying it out. And I would like to show you in several overheads uh, what is happening in the Netherlands, where they made a decision to be an example for the world. And in doing so, they were able to have 80,000 industries, companies, we'll say, move out and take the lead. And they are seven years into a 25-year plan for total environmental recovery. And they're very much on target. These are the basic themes that they have that they're managing for. And they're the trains, the, the locomotives pulling the trains of environmental recovery in the nation. I mentioned information. This is an example of what we don't have. The Dutch know exactly where their pollution is coming from. And when industry said, all right, we know how to manage. You've got your, your statistics. Let's work together. Only don't harass us with a lot of micromanagement. We'll give you the information. And then let us respond in a legal agreement. Here's an immediate response from one of their dirtiest industries on their track as to how they would clean up. This isn't theory. This isn't make-believe. This is seven years into a program for a nation's total environmental recovery funded with billions, not millions, changes in priorities, a reason to be hopeful to the point that the majority of the population of Holland is excited that they are providing a demonstration for the world for environmental recovery and demonstrating that government can work very well in doing this. Another advantage that lets government be more efficient, this is an example of a collective database and the result you can have. Every school child, every government decision maker, every corporate decision maker in a second can know right out the global what their effect is going to be of a decision say it's an energy choice. And that is an example, dramatically, of why we have, why at least I'm very optimistic about the future. In the clearest outline, it's a social contract. Children, bank presidents, and corporations are involved. And they are succeeding. The question that, of course, is asked, well, I would get this from every audience, well, that's fine for Holland, but they're small. U.S. is big and complex, and we're different, and we could never do anything like that. A business wouldn't cooperate. This is an example of a major accomplishment where we were told that energy policy had to increase 7% a year forever. This was 20 years ago. Why? Because an economist had planned it that way. There was no real basis for it. We argued that wasn't the case. We stopped it there, we reversed it, and industry took the lead, as did others, to manage, my second point, the dilemma that the nation and state faced. And there are the results. We were told California will be in the dark if you guys follow that plan. 13 years later, you'll note, the economy had grown by about a third in trillions with no real net increase in energy. It was a matter of management and demonstrates very clearly what the US is capable of. But the, but the real radical thought here is cooperation. That's what we haven't tried. We've gotten things so locked up, everybody abusing government, particularly economists, make a living doing it. We all blame government. Well, government is us. And government is a remarkable only path for the future if we want to save America and the world. It's a, an important tool to use, and we should use it. So I have, in essence, said that because of changes, government is much more capable and daily becoming more so. Information management, the, the profession of management itself, communication, education, a lot of other themes that add up to a capability that hasn't been there in the past. I've certainly criticized government, and I hope I do many times in the future, but it's a changed ballgame. We can't deal with ideas from the past and survive. And these days, I'm refusing to do so. 
The word sustainability is an interesting one. I would say sustainability is taking the word economics head on. There's a major change because as we're seeing the conditions of the world, whether it's threatened oceans, the problem of human waste going down the Mississippi, government has to be there to manage the quality of that water coming from the bars of Montana all the way to Missoula. Or not Missoula, but where was Okay. So I would argue that sustainability will replace economics. The importance of it is that it has a social base as well as an economic one. I think that it provides a basis for public trust. If you don't have your children believing the future is possible, no nation is going to make it. Ask yourselves if you know any children who are worried about the future because they fear the environment is going to go away on them. The majority do. I disagree with the themes of privatization, the focus on the individual, and other themes that so often the economists push. I think it was an interesting tool to develop the nation. I think, however, it is now outmoded, and I expect it, and in fact, it already is declining, as an agent of change. At one time, you could say, Economists and their theories were the engine driving the American economy and the world economy. They've now become the caboose. And I don't want to leave without pointing out that I nonetheless agree with some points here. The, uh, the idea of managing well and using economics, the polluter pays, the end of subsidies, uh, wolf compensation is a, is a small example. And a lot of other themes are very useful tactics as tools to be included in the management process of solving the environmental dilemma by getting government out in front, cooperating with industry, and moving into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Huey. In an age of growing environmental concerns, leading resource economist, one of those economists Huey was talking about, I guess, Terry Anderson is defining a new course for achieving environmental quality. He believes that market approaches can, both, can be both economically sound and environmentally sensitive. Terry's research helped launch the idea of free market environmentalism and prompted public debate over the proper role of government in managing resources. Government subsidies often degrade the environment, he points out, but private property rights encourage resource stewardship and market incentives harness individual initiative for protecting environmental quality. His broad-ranging ideas have provided a new look at complex and seemingly intractable environmental problems. PERC, the Political Economy Research Center, which Terry directs, advocates free market environmentalism and serves as a forum for disseminating related research and information. Terry's the author of, or editor of 14 books, <clears throat> including Free Market Environmentalism with Donald Leal, which is the definitive treatment of the subject. He's published widely in both professional journals and the popular press, including the Wall Street Journal, the Christian Science Monitor, and Fly Fisherman. He's a frequently requested lecturer, known for his articulate and provocative presentations, which we will hear in a moment. He's also an economic historian who's written extensively on the shaping of the American West, and as a professor of economics at Montana State University. Here. <coughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, I was, I was uh, pleased that Huey called me the caboose instead of another term I could think of that you <laughs> might hear for economists. Uh, uh, that was very polite, Huey. Uh, economists, of course, are always the brunt of jokes, and most of them are well-deserved, I, I suspect. Uh, uh, and a lot of them have to do with the kinds of models that we put forward as economists. Uh, and I won't, uh, I won't burden you with too many of them. I'll just give you uh, one that I got recently in an introduction, which was, uh, you know what an economist is, don't you? And I was obliged to, of course, say no. And I was told that an economist is someone who is uh, 
pretty good with numbers, but doesn't have enough personality to be an accountant. Uh, I was then given my economist hat, which I thought I could wear for the evening speech. Uh, this uh, green visor, of course, uh, 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 typifies sort of uh, the kind of approach that an economist might take. Being obsessed with things like efficiency and the kind of modeling that Huey talked about. Uh, and I hope you'll bear with me for just a few minutes while I, I walk you through some fundamental points that I think you'll need to understand the rest of this lecture. Now, uh, most of you probably had college education, so you no doubt had some economics, so I don't think it'll take too long to get through uh, the material I have here. Uh, you'll understand that, of course, we have in economics these things we call isoquants that trace out the uh, possibilities for producing various commodities uh, using labor and capital and resources of the environment, and, and we can track uh, how you'd combine these things to, to uh, produce the exact amount that you'd want, and uh, we, could, we could put on here budget constraints, and, well, and, and eventually, if you, if you really, uh, if you study <laughs> economics long enough, you, you get to understand, well, finally we get to this resource uh, conversion path that you can see here, uh, this curve that, that shoots out here to the left. Uh, and, well, uh, and then ultimately, really, what's important is you get here to this, this curve right here, this BB curve, which shows the production possibilities that an economy is capable of producing. And then all you need to do is impose upon that the uh, social welfare function, which we all know about, and you find the tangency point, which gets you to omega, which uh, indeed is uh, what economists call the bliss point. <laughs> now, if you've had economics, you've probably seen all that crap. Uh, that's really what a lot of economics is about, and it's a lot, in a sense, of what I learned in graduate school to a certain extent. I can remember very fondly the lecture when we went through these graphs and accompanying them the uh, mathematics, which was always uh, a bit difficult for me. But I can remember so distinctly as the professor went through and there was all this logic behind these neat graphs. And then when we got to omega, and I knew that as an economist, I could take society to the bliss point, I sort of thought, you know, I mean, what more could you ask out of your career than be able to take society to the bliss point. I, you know, I mean, you could be a doctor, you could win a Nobel Prize, but taking society to omega is, is where it's really at. Well, of course, uh, if you think that's what I believe today, you're wrong. In fact, perhaps Huey and I were ships passing in the night at some point, because I started graduate school as a sort of left-wing liberal. And uh, when I found out that I could take society to the bliss point, if only I knew the social welfare function and the production function, uh, I thought, this is great, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, I'll get, I'll get a job in government and uh, I'll be able to solve all these problems. I was once at a cocktail party, uh, this was m many years later, after I had made the transition uh, going the other direction from Huey, uh, and I was sitting next to a dentist, I recall, and after a few beers, he said, you know, I've never heard an economist talk the way you do. He said, uh, in 25 words or less, how did you come to that position? He'd obviously heard economists and professors before. And I said, well, I can give it to you in two words. It took me a while to condense it down. And I said, I learned in graduate school in the first six weeks, incentives matter. And as soon as I got those words and, and understood what that meant, I changed the way I thought about how we might organize the cooperation that we need in society to solve all kinds of problems, not just the production of bread and fish and guns and butter, and eventually, uh, for my career, more importantly, how we might produce more environmental amenities. Indeed, in Chris's, in Chris's introduction, she said that Huey and I share, I think, not just a compassion for killing uh, those animals, uh, but uh, a passion for that, but as well a passion, I think, for how we might improve environmental equality. If you really believed in the graphs that I had up here, showing these nonsense ideas, in my opinion, if you really believed in them, you'd have to understand, first, in order to really believe you can get to the bliss point, or I would put it differently, to believe that you can really truly plan, be it green planning or socialist planning in the Soviet Union, you need a tremendous amount of information. You need to believe that you can concentrate very much information in a few people, who become the experts who, in Thomas Sowell's uh, words, said, 
This requires the special knowledge of the few to guide the actions of the many. If you believe you can do this, if you believe you can get to the bliss point, then, in fact, planning is a real possibility. But I don't think that the kind of information required to do significant planning is possible. Secondly, even if you could get to that required information, even if you could give me the information to find omega, don't trust me. Not because I'm not a person of integrity, but because the pressures that will be put upon me to achieve omega in light of a world where corporations might desire not to achieve omega, in light of a world where individuals like you and like me might desire something than maximizing social welfare, then you have to understand that incentives make a big difference. Whether we're talking about incentives facing a decision maker running a corporation, or incentives facing a planner who might implement these plans. Now at this point on my notes, I had crossed out because I thought, well, I don't want to dwell on this because surely no one would, would today hold this up as an example of, of uh, how we ought to run things. And the <coughs> example I have here is water. Now, Huey talked about water, and I think there is no better example of what goes haywire when you have the government involved in a significant way in planning. While Stegner has written about it, as have numerous other environmentalists, there are no significant dams in this country that would pass any kind of sensible economic muster. None. I've written three books on the subject. I have found none that would pass such muster. Why do they exist? They exist simply because we had people who believed they could find Omega who believed they could make the desert bloom like a rose. You can make the desert bloom like a rose, but at a tremendous environmental cost. Read the San Francisco Chronicle this morning on the Mekong River. We will spend, no doubt, as citizens of the United States through the World Bank and other development banks, tremendous amounts of money to build a dam on the Mekong, Mekong River, all in the interest of progress, all in the interest of social welfare, all in the interest of doing good for those people. It is a case of planning. It is a case of management. It is a case of progressive change. All words that I think we ought to be very skeptical of. And I think there is no better example, or if you will, worse example of planning than water. So if that's the case, uh, what's the alternative? And here, I'll switch from my economics hat and put on, indeed, my environmentalist hat. Uh, because I am an environmentalist. I believe that you can be an environmentalist. Uh, I do actually do wear this hat. Not only does it absorb sweat, which I do a lot whenever I even walk up a set of steps, but in addition to that, it uh, unfolds and covers the spot on top and uh, provides a sunscreen that's far better than uh, uh, even 15 or 20. Uh, now, I obviously put on a red bandana to get a bit of humor, perhaps, but I, I do want to, to, to emphasize that, that I think you can be an environmentalist and not necessarily be a more government type or a more planning type. And as Chris suggested in the introduction, the way I think you achieve that is through what I call free market environmentalism. Free market environmentalism can be simplified uh, quite easily. And over the years and the number of speeches I've given with 15 minute constraints, I've decided you can boil it down to two very simple tenets. The first tenet is wealthier is healthier. If you look around the world and ask, I thought of this this morning when I was brushing my teeth and taking a drink of water in the hotel. I did not hesitate for one second to take a big gulp of water to put it on my tooth uh, brush. I didn't hesitate for one second. I should have hesitated two months ago while lecturing in Guatemala and didn't. Uh, and I paid the price. Now, what's the difference between Guatemala and the United States? The answer is quite simple, the wealth. And the wealth is what gives us the wherewithal to take care of environmental problems. And there can be little doubt today that wealth comes from free societies, free societies that depend on market systems that give to people both the incentive to produce income and wealth and the signals through prices that tell us what to produce, when to produce it, and where to produce it. In fact, the energy numbers that are up here are very revealing. They don't suggest, in my opinion, the, uh, the great successes of planning, 
but rather demonstrate exactly what happened when we suppressed energy prices throughout the 1960s, subsidized energy delivery. I grew up thinking you should live better electrically with your electric toothbrush and garage door opener and the list goes on. We distorted the prices and encouraged people to not worry about energy consumption. Thanks to the Arabs, we got the big slap in the face that we should have had earlier and said, prices are going higher, folks. And when they went higher, we responded. And we responded more because of <coughs> higher prices than because some president told us to turn down the thermostat. Prices matter. Wealth matters. The data are unequivocal. And I draw your attention. Uh, coming close to home here for you, an index of, eco of environmental ind indicators published by the Pacific Research Institute here in San Francisco. I have a couple of copies. I'd be happy to give it to those people who need it the most. Uh, but the data in here suggests for the US and Canada that we are improving. And we have been improving. And we will continue to improve. And the reason we can afford to do it is because we're wealthy enough. Two quick stories on that point. One, when a conference was being held, and, and a group of blacks from Africa were being admonished not to let multinational companies bring pollution to those countries. A black woman in the discussion section, session said, we would love to have a chance to die of cancer. It is an old person's disease. Think about what that means. Those people in African countries where the average age of death is 46, don't worry much about the problems that you and I worry about because they simply don't have the wealth to do so. Free markets will give them that opportunity. Second one, a bit more humorous. I was in Rio just before the Eco Summit in 1992. We were trying to cross Rio in a rainstorm when the troops were practicing for the arrival of all the dignitaries. The cab driver was frustrated hearing us in the back seat speaking English. He turned to us and said, you, Eco 92. And we said, no, 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 we're here for another conference. We're not part of that. He said, good. Eco-92, bullshit. And again, as I say, a bit more humorous, but this was a person trying to eke out a living and saying, now we have a bunch of wealthy environmentalists from developed countries coming here to talk about why we shouldn't have economic growth. I'm not here to say that economic growth is a panacea. I'm not here to say that economic growth has not brought with it some environmental degradation. But surely we have to understand that without economic growth, we will not have economic improvement, and we will not have economic growth without free markets. The second, and perhaps even more important, tenet of free market environmentalism is that we need to get the incentives right. Getting the incentives right, incentives matter, is the key part of what free market environmentalism has to offer to environmentalists. Now, I don't simply mean getting the right taxes to find Omega. I don't simply mean getting the right government plans in place to either subsidize, tax, or otherwise encourage through carrots and sticks brought on by government. I mean by free markets simply that individuals with private ownership of resources have an incentive to either benefit from or pay the benefit from doing good or pay the cost of doing bad. Let me give a couple of very quick examples. First, in the case of doing good, a good friend of mine, Tom Borland, was a biologist, is a biologist. Tom Borland works for, worked for International Paper. Tom Borland understood when he was hired by International Paper in the late 1980s that he was their token environmentalist. Affirmative action through, in a sense, the Endangered Species Act, if you will. IP knew they had to have somebody that they could say was sort of watching out. So Tom went out on his first mission to a place where they were going to cut trees on private lands. And he said, an eagle is nesting in that tree. And they came out. They said, which tree? He said, that one. And they spray painted a big blue X on it and clear cut 40 acres around it. Tom said, and I've, I've heard him tell these stories, seen the pictures, so these are, these are true. I'm not embellishing anything. Tom said, that didn't quite work the way I wanted it to. Next, he found a colony of red cockaded woodpeckers. Well, red cockaded woodpeckers take more than one tree. Same story, though. Which trees? All those which had cavities, they spray painted and clear cut around you know, 15 or 20 trees in that case. And Tom said, this is not working. Why isn't it? And he said, the reason it's not working is that I'm asking foresters who have to report to their people, who ultimately have to report to shareholders, to not make profits off the resource. 
I need to switch it around. I need to find a way they can get rewards from doing good. Well, to make a long story short, Tom implemented fee hunting, uh, which I, I think is good. Tom implemented renting out small parcels of land to mom and pop to park their little mobile home or trailer, camper trailer on in the summer and go hiking and fishing with the kids. When Tom left IP to start a very successful and lucrative consulting business where he does the same thing now with lots of forests in the southeast, 25% of IP's net profits were coming from non-timber resources. That's getting the incentives right. They do not clear cut down to riparian areas. Why? Because those areas are simply too valuable to forego the recreational amenities on and the other amenities that come with them. Uh, in the interest of time, and I'll be happy to take on other examples as we go on, Huey mentioned things like the Wolf Program that a good friend of mine, Hank Fisher, runs. But let me give you one on the other side, because I think it's important to understand getting the incentive right means rewarding people, but it also means making people bear the cost. And, and Huey talked about uh, the number of times that water has recycled as it flows down the Mississippi. That is a classic case of government getting in the way of property rights. And let me give you the quintessential example of this. The city of Chicago was taking water, drinking water, out of Lake Michigan. The city of Milwaukee was dumping sewage into Lake Michigan. The city of Chicago sued the city of Milwaukee and said, cease and desist. The city of Milwaukee, and they did it not on the basis of any environmental law, they did it strictly on the basis of a free market property rights based system, common law. They said, you can't pollute a resource that we have a claim to. They went to court. The court said, Milwaukee, cease and desist now, pay damages, and install the treatment equipment that would stop you from doing this any longer. That happened in 1972 when we passed the US Clean Water Act. Milwaukee looked at the Clean Water Act and said, ha ha, we already have in place the equipment that the Clean Water Act says you have to have in place. We don't have to do anything and indeed backed away from what the court said they had to do under common law, under statutory law, got by with polluting more than they had to under common law. That's getting the incentives wrong. And again, I could go through other examples, but I'll conclude. The essence of free market environmentalism is get the incentives right. Whenever I give speeches on this subject, if I convince you that maybe it will work for Tom Borland and IP, maybe it would even work for some pollution, invariably I get, if you're so blasted smart, how about global warming or ozone? I don't pretend that free markets are a panacea for everything. If global warming is a problem, I don't have a free market solution for you. But I don't think green planning does either, because first, we don't know whether it's a problem, and second, I don't think we can trust the incentives that come with political systems. All that free market environmentalism is about is really getting the incentives right in our local house, getting our own house in order, and if we do that through free market environmentalism, then I think we go a long ways to starting to achieve the kind of environmental successes that we've enjoyed in the United States and pursuing those in other countries. At the same time, we do it without impinging on human freedom and without dictating to other countries how they ought to live. It won't solve it all, but it will help a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Huey, do you want to offer a rebuttal to that? Yes. <laughs> The point I care most about is reality. We have to deal with the reality that we have problems that have to be managed. And while we're trying to adjust and get the incentives right, and we've told these individuals, go ahead and, you know, it's your world, things happen to us, like the East LA riots. And what how many times have we had dilemmas like that because people are unemployed, the economic system didn't work for them, they were in this lower rung where they didn't have the incentives and the income. 
Well, what was the answer to the East LA riots with the current administration? Free market. So they hired Mr. Uberoth, who jauntily went in to apply free market approaches to solving this dilemma by bringing in a billion dollars in investments, etc. Failed cold. That is still a tinderbox down there. He didn't get the billion in investments. And I think those kinds of dilemmas are always lurking around these theoretical themes that don't understand the strength of sustainability, which for the first time takes in these kinds of social dilemmas and has the confidence to move forward. I would look at individual incentives in the sustainability mode and suggest that incentives have to concern a lot more than income. People who work in the military, church, teachers, environmental groups are really little bothered by the kind of incentives that the economists normally are thinking about. It's a spirit of the idea, and unless we have that kind of incentive, unless we believe that cooperation and working together can deliver a livable future, we're not going to make it anyway. We get this weird imbalance with 5% of the population owning 90% of the wealth and these people rioting in East LA because they don't own anything. We can't afford education. We can't afford to clean up the environment under the old models. I'm arguing that by using the real examples that exist, we can. The Dutch, New Zealand, Singapore models. I was in Singapore 40 years ago. It was dangerous to walk down the street at night. And they didn't, they had a plan. They got the first green politician. And he came in and he told his troops in Chinese style, clean up the rivers, clean up the country. Now when you visit Singapore, you could lay on a park bench with your billfold on your chest and nobody would bother you. And these are successful models. This isn't, oh, well, we've got to do it this way or that way. And my own existence, in the few years I have left, I'm really not interested now in worrying about theories that were being tested in the past and are still around. There are honest working concepts using new tools with goals and objectives, and they're getting results. The Dutch model has an objective of total environmental recovery in 25 years and seven years into it. And it's a plan that has school children and 80,000 corporations, not eight, not 80, 80,000 corporations out in front cooperating and loving the fact that they have regulations that they have a part in now. They don't want to throw out regulations. They say, heck no, we want environmental quality. And we love command and control. There's still 20% of Dutch industry that would pollute in a minute if they get away with it. But now the majority are self-policing. They don't let them get away with it. That is hard reality happening, and it's a doorway to the future. I don't believe that focusing on individual incentives, the uh, themes that economists still advocate, uh, are going to be the answer. I think there are a lot of uh, fascinating indicators. One of the fun ones for me, anyway, was the Soros paper in Atlantic Monthly a couple of months ago, and I'm sure most of you read it. Here was a guy that's a billionaire, and he comes out, and he also said, look, I don't like the idea of narrow capitalism. He said, gee, I grew up in Hungary, and at my first stage of my life, I lived under the Nazi regime. And then the communists came along. And he said, you know, they're very similar. They have one truth, and if you don't believe it, they shoot you. And he said, it's getting that way with this emphasis of market economy, of capital, he argued that we have to maintain a diverse society in order to succeed in whatever our challenges are. That is an example, I would argue, of this tradition of economic uh, dominance of, of, as a tool for policymaking disintegrating. How's my time? A few, a few more minutes. A few more minutes. <laughs> uh, I think that one of the important points for me is, again, to acknowledge the importance of using incentives, of using the kind of themes that my colleague is talking about, but as you would use it as a spice in food. It isn't the food. 
and the Dutch example, where they have their goals and objectives and they're meeting them, where they are cleaning up their water, they're cleaning up their farm soils, they acknowledge that their toxics floating around in the air are cause of a cancer epidemic. We're still struggling to admit that, though I hope we're closer. And a lot is happening and a lot is moving in this direction that I believe will lead us to happy, healthy, well-fed future generations. But we're going to leave much of the economic thinking that's dominated us in this century behind. Thank you. Terry? The last point that Huey made is perhaps a, a good place to start. He talked about the Dutch goals and object, objectives, and uh, though I haven't I've traveled through Holland but not lived there, I have lived in New Zealand for a while. And, and I certainly would be the last to suggest that uh, groups can't set goals and objectives, can't do it in cooperative ways, and can't do it outside of markets. Uh, in fact, you might find it hard to believe, but I actually live in a very communal world. Uh, I'm a member of a commune. We call it the family. At my house, we don't price the food on the table. Uh, we uh, cooperate. We set goals and objectives. My wife and I, sometimes we're pretty heavy-handed with a couple of the other members, uh, use a little command and control. Uh, but I think that works very well. I think you can go beyond even that size community, four in my case, to larger communities and accomplish some of the goals and objectives that can be set in those, those uh, uh, fairly narrow, heter homogeneous groups. And you can achieve a great deal of cooperation. And in fact, if, if anything, I, I think economists have, have uh, greatly uh, exaggerated the lack of cooperation, the extent to which self-interest dominates. And we, have, we, as a profession, economists have, have underplayed the importance of cooperation, even in heterogeneous societies. I draw your attention to a book that I think is one of the more important books to be written in the last 10 years, probably, written by Matt Ridley, uh, a biologist from, from England, uh, a book called The Origins of Virtue. And Matt uh, understands economics well, and he points out that it's interesting that in a world where there's so much self-interest, there is so much cooperation. So I believe that you can get cooperation. I just am very skeptical about how far you can get with it when you get to a society certainly the size of the United States that is as heterogeneous and as diverse as ours. Now, will it work for San Francisco? I'm even skeptical there. Will it wor work for Russian Hill? Perhaps. Will it work in Marin County? Perhaps. But it is the examples of New Zealand and, and Holland, I think, uh, uh, ignore some of the problems that come with a real diverse society. So cooperation is important. I think it's important to teach people to be cooperative. I, I mean, my children uh, learn about cooperation in our household, and I hope I've inculcated them in them some of these ideas. But again, going beyond this, I think uh, we have to be skeptical about. If we go beyond the small societies where cooperation is possible, I think we kind of wave our hands off and say, we're going to have cooperation, and we're going to do it under planning, and we're going to do it under government. Government is not cooperation. Government, by definition, is coercion. It is coercing people to do what a collective somehow has decided. Now, I, you know, I obviously don't oppose that entirely. I'm not an anarchist. Uh, I wasn't with the, the uh, Montana militia out in eastern Montana <laughs> last winter. Uh, so I'm not a total anarchist. I do believe you need some coercion. But I think we can go too far. And let me give I mean, I mean, the example of business saying, well, we really like this command and control. We really like this planning. I'm very skeptical of, and I'm very skeptical of because of, of a, a one particular example. I mean, there are others, but this one stands out. In 1997, when the Clean Air Amendments were passed by the US Congress, those amendments included some very strict restrictions on the way coal-fired generating plants would have to deal with SO2 emissions. And those amendments included basically installing very expensive technology, scrubbers on stacks on those, uh, on, on those plants. After a few years passed and people started to look at this, what we realized was that we got a situation where we had more expensive electricity, dirtier air, and we looked back and said, why? And the answer was quite simple. 
businesses involved in electricity said, we agree, let's have command and control. But by the way, let's grandfather the existing plants in. They didn't have to have it. And then, as economists looked at that, they said, well, why would we have done this? How could we have achieved better air? And the answer was, burn clean Montana and Wyoming coal. Why didn't we? Because the eastern coal interests said, we don't want you burning Montana coal. We want you burning West Virginia coal. Bring to mind somebody named Senator Byrd. He lobbied for emissions. Once you required the emission control equipment to be on there, you surely weren't going to haul coal from eastern Montana, which was very expensive to haul, and instead of using very dirty eastern coal. So we used eastern dirty coal, which put out far more SO2 than if we had put no technology on those, no scrubbers on those stacks. And the result was much more expensive electricity for consumers. Now, why did business support that? Answer was simple. It restricted competition. Command and control is not something that business opposes. Over and over in this country, business has said, give us command and control because it's the only way we can restrict competition. So I get very skeptical of, of this. Finally, I'm not surprised that, I, I would certainly not argue that regulations won't work. When rivers were burning in Ohio, regulations, although there's now some data to suggest that maybe the rivers were being cleaned up before the regulations, but that aside, accepting that regulation did it, it was easy to get those regulations because everybody agreed burning rivers were bad. We picked the low apples from the tree with regulation. Now we're reaching for high apples. And those high apples involve things like cleaning up Superfund sites to the point where the dirt will be edible by children. They involve cleaning up rivers in Montana so that you won't get cancer, meaning that you won't have your chance of cancer go up by 1 in 10,000 if you drink untreated water from the source one liter a day for seven years of your, 70 years of your life and eat a quarter pound of fish from the source every day, of sev every day for 70 years of your life. We're cleaning up arsenic out of Montana rivers to meet those standards. Now, those are high apples. If you think that we can continue to afford that kind of regulation, I think you're wrong. People are starting to say, in places like Montana, don't tell us we have to do that. We would rather have more hospitals, more schools, maybe more tennis courts. But we don't think it's necessary to achieve those high standards. And so, again, I think regulation can work. I think it has worked but I think it can go too far. And in the case of the United States, we're reaching for the highest apples on the tree. If we think we're going to achieve them with command and control, we're wrong. If we want to achieve them, the only way we'll succeed is to get the incentive right through market processes. Well, um, picking up on that, <clears throat> I wonder if um, I could ask you both to comment on whether you believe that the condition of the United States environment has improved over the last 25 years. And if it has, whether you would attribute that to regulatory factors or to improved private sector efficiency. And um, maybe speak a bit about distinguishing between the, regula the regulatory climate that characterized 1965 to 1980 when very significant environmental legislation, clean air, clean water, NEPA, OSHA, were passed. Uh, even with Republicans, for example, in the White House, if Republicans are conventionally thought of as being uh, less environmentally supportive and Democrats more environmentally supportive, um, to the t regulatory, uh, to, to the climate in which we find ourselves now, where I would say there's a much more hostile, generally a more hostile approach towards environmental regulation. Well, I'll, I'll just start on the, on the first question. There's little doubt that the environment has improved. I mean, I think data are unequivocal on that point. And I think there's also little doubt that, that why it's improved is, is at least in part to regulation. It's also in part due to the point I was making about wealthier is healthier. As we've gotten wealthier, not only do we want nicer cars, more TV sets, and whatever else, we want more wilderness areas. I mean, we have... In the United States, wilderness areas equal to the size of this state set aside where you can't ride a mountain bike. Okay? Now, not many societies can afford that. We can, and we've demanded that since 1964. It's come about with government. Uh, 
So there's no question it's improved, and there's no question it's improved in part because of regulation. The important question that I think follows from that, though, is uh, or there are really two important questions. One is, would it, would it, would it have improved had we not have those re had those regulations? And I've just read a paper by uh, to, uh, a law professor and an economist suggesting that if common law had been in place, and I, I hearken back to my point about the, the water pollution case of, of Chicago versus Milwaukee, uh, that we would have gotten these improvements anyway, and in fact, we might have gotten even more improvements. Now, that's a hypothetical. It requires research, and you know, when it's you, not what, what do you mean when, by common law? Why don't you, All I mean by common law is that when people have, under common law, people have the right not to be infringed upon by other people. I can't double up my fist and punch Huey in the face, much as I'd like to because he called me a caboose. Uh, but uh, I can't do that because Huey has some rights that say his nose is, is private uh, domain and I, my fist shouldn't violate that. Similarly, if I truly am dumping my gunk into Huey's uh, well, under common law, and there are lots of examples of this, he had every right to sue me to cease and desist. So, so would we have gotten improvement under that system is one question. The second question, and I think this is important, is how much is enough? And that's my point about cleaning up water. We can go so far that people start to scoff at our environmental regulations, which is exactly what's happening in Montana when people say clean up arsenic, which comes, by the way, out of geysers in Yellowstone, and clean it up to the point where, again, you would people wouldn't get increased chances of cancer if they drank water for 70 years and ate fish for 70 years. Those are absurd. People look at them and they just laugh at them eventually. So have we gone too far is another question. And I, I guess I think that's what command and control does. It goes too far. Theory. The advance of environmental quality in the U.S. has occurred. It hasn't gone as far as it should have and could have, considering what we did spend. But what has happened in the interim is we've learned a lot. And what we've learned is that we can't manage resources one at a time. We can't pick theoretical examples of one resource. We're going to deal with forestry policy this year, water policy next year, energy policy someday. What we've learned, or what we're learning, and the, these other small nations are showing us very clearly, is that you have to manage the whole package. The, when we or transcend to that point, which we're doing, we will have remarkable advance, similar to what the Dutch are enjoying. And this is the most critical point that I would present today. The largest use of electrical energy in the state of California in any one day is pumping water. Well, how do you get the energy to pump the water? Well, you have to burn some fuel. So all of a sudden, you've got an air quality problem. And you can't manage thus water unless you're managing your electrical energy production and your air quality standards because acid rain will kill your crops and ruin your forests and a few other things we're beginning to learn. What we have begun to discover in this new era that we're moving into, that I'm arguing will be our future, is that we can manage things comprehensively and that that is the way we're going to do it in the future and industry understands that very clearly. That is what they do. Even a library manager here. It's got to be concerned not only with a leaking roof, but employee relations and physical plant and a whole bunch of things. We have always allowed ourselves these narrow looks at a resource, thinking we could specially focus on them and deal with them, first in a theoretical fashion, somehow reduce them down to some manageable unit. The reverse is true. So I believe that the future here, and it's already happening, as these corporations are seeing Companies like 3M working in Holland come back and say, gee, that's a far better way to do it. Let's do it that way, too. And it's happening here anyway. Well, picking up on, on your point somewhat, Huey, actually, this is a question for Terry. Um, in, in one of your articles, you say that arguably there are instances where pollution crosses state borders or water use in one state affects downstream states, but, cent but centralization, presumably regulation at, at the federal level, has come with high costs. Um, I would say, first, it's not only arguable, it's sort of indisputable that um, uh, pollution is crossing boundaries and that what happens in 
in one place has an, an impact on a far, a far away place. Ask people who live in Lake Michigan who are dealing with uh, pesticide deposition from farming in Texas. Ask people who live in Arizona who watch the water level go up and down of the Colorado River. You were talking about uh, dams as air conditioning needs increase in Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Ask people who live in Mexico who experience a, a mere trickle of the Rio Grande River after it has managed to pass through um, Western U.S. states. Um, so I guess my question is, I think that you, point a fair, you, you paint a fairly black and white picture here of um, command and control versus local control of resources. And um, I think that this ignores the relational nature of ecosystems that, that know no boundaries. And I'm concerned about how that, that relational nature, which is what I think the omega point is about understanding interdependence and interconnectivity in the way that we live on the planet, how those interests prevail at some level as opposed to selfish local parochial interests. Well, let, let me take the, the extreme case, I suppose, of, of ecosystems. If, if you've read any of, of the literature on complexity uh, and, and uh, chaos theory, uh, the essence is that everything is interconnected. So when the butterfly flaps its wings in, uh, uh, in Japan, we end up with a, a hurricane someplace or a typhoon someplace. Now, you know, maybe those connections occur, but I don't, I don't think we're at all close to understanding what those are if they exist, and, and I think that's what you learn from complexity theory. Uh, and, so I'd, and, and even if we were, I don't know how we would solve that problem with governments because a, a butterfly flapping its wings in Japan is hardly, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't argue that, well, maybe we ought to go to war with Japan because it was Japan's butterfly or something like that. I, you know, so I don't, I don't see how you can manage it at that level. So if we, if we say, well, all right, let's bring it down to, let, let's put some boundaries on ecosystems. Let's just not talk about a world ecosystem. Let's talk about an ecosystem that involves, say, like, the Great Lakes. And no question there are interconnections in the Great Lakes and, and there's no question that those interconnections involve people who live in different political jurisdictions. And in some sense that's the problem. Those political jurisdictions have a great deal of power. Some have more power than others because they have more votes and so some are able to, to get laws passed that say it's okay if we dump our gunk into those lakes uh, because we have more political power than others and you guys are going to have to live with it. Uh, so I, I just don't trust that system, I guess. Maybe the only system, it may be the, the, the only one that we can devise, but again, I think we ought to look for common law solutions first. Secondly, I don't think we ought to take a global perspective of local problems. Local problems ought to be solved more locally. The more you can devolve them, the better. In the case of water, it is not the case that all water systems in the U.S. interconnect with all other water systems. They simply don't. And given that they don't, why should we have the federal government regulating them? If we're going to talk about regulation, as Huey has pointed out, let's have Mississippi, let's have a Mississippi Basin regulatory agency, if you will, rather than the EPA. Uh, I just finished editing a book that will come out later this year entitled Environmental Federalism, and there's a, a, a paper summarizing that book outside, or there were when I came in. Uh, and all that says is, Look for the right political jurisdictions. It takes some imaginative thinking about, you know, how you ought to do that. But if, I mean, I don't pretend for a second to believe that this is going to happen in the U.S. because we're not going to get rid of the EPA. The EPA is not going to want to say, oh, yeah, you're right, let's turn uh, the Mississippi over to some regulatory basin that doesn't come out of Washington, D.C. Or take the Sacramento. I mean, that's a big, big river basin. I think it ought to be managed as a basin to the extent that there are these spillover effects. But again, I think, uh, I don't see any reason why EPA ought to be involved with it. I think California and, uh, you know, ought to basically be the manager of that system. Uh, and, and final point, just with respect to the Colorado. Again, I rest my case on planning right there. The Colorado problems exist in large part because of the damn dams that we built there. Uh, end of that discussion. We are lifting water, talk about pumping costs, we're lifting water 4,000 vertical feet out of the Colorado into the Tucson Basin uh, where it isn't even all being used because there are cheaper sources of water anyway. 
And that just is ridiculous. But planning is kind of an interesting word, isn't it? Because it does suggest some kind of godlike omniscience about uh, how we should manage resources. And I'm really talking about something else. I'm talking about how do people who live in faraway places or maybe right next to each other, but who are clearly connected to each other through the, a river that runs through, through an ocean that they share, through the migrating species that come or don't come, depending on what has happened along a particular migratory route, whether the route uh, is, is um, intact to the extent that it can support those creatures that become integral, uh, integral along any, any place along the route. How do, we, how do we find these ways to work together as people, whether it has to do with government or not, but that, that contemplates and understands that our survival depends on it. And I think to, to sort of quickly jump to it's, it's either government or no government or a butterfly flapping you know, in China having an impact halfway around the world, I realize the importance of extreme examples to make a rhetorical point. But I think that um, you know, what we're talking about here is um, um, very, uh, very tangible and very important to us as we live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and so Huey, what, one of the things that I want to ask you that arises out of this is, as I've heard you speak about green planning and, um, and especially what's happened in, in the Netherlands, I see that government and corporations are, are working together. Certainly there are those who would argue that in, in, in this country, maybe all countries, that big government responds to big business and that they, aren't, uh, they don't necessarily represent different points of view. So what I want to know is, where are the NGOs in all of this? Because I do believe that it has been NGOs nationally and internationally who have been on the leading edge of environmental change. But where's their power in, at the table? The way it works, in my view, is that they transmit confidence in the system to the watching, voting public. And it is as though you had a three-legged stool. You've got government, you've got industry, and you've got the environmental sector. The fascinating thing about the Dutch approach is that industry and government understand that they're going to have to go through some awful tough head knocking and compromise in order to move down the road in this process toward total environmental cleanup. How soon do they do it? What avenues do they take first? And so their way around it, interestingly, is to provide funding so that the environmental critics are energetic and vital and there. And so they give funding to the environmental movement, and that movement will turn around and sue government or industries using the same money. But it's because it's a shared sense of destiny that people at every level understand they're pulling on the same rope. They're going to, as they would have in the past, prepare for war. Now they're in a struggle for survival, that their grandchildren are threatened unless they all pull together. They've got a, quite a remarkable social condition moving, which has strong economic Upsides, by the way, they're, they're probably the first, they and these other countries I've mentioned, the first societies in history that have known what the costs are of doing something. And uh, this is a fascinating place because it's open public information. The NGOs transmit to the press in very critical ways what they think each day, each week. And the press happily reports to the people. Uh, we haven't been that effective here as yet. But I have great faith that that is the role of the environmental movement in the United States. And um, as we move into this comprehensive, let's solve the problem dimension that I believe we will move into, that the role of the NGO will be defined in a similar powerful way. It is, at the present time, I think, uh, being done that way, but the recognition isn't there. Uh, in a moment, I'd like to open that up uh, to questions from the audience. So please be thinking about that. And, and we have a microphone down here. So since this is being uh, recorded for broadcast on KQED, if you have questions, if you could line up down at this mic, that would be terrific. Um, this is a question uh, that I'm interested in both of your response to. Uh, Terry, free market environmentalism posits really that everything's for sale or that everything can be um, uh, evaluated economically, dollar signs. Um, and in one of your articles, you laud a state park system for becoming economically self-sufficient by holding dances and weddings in the park and creating a Christmas in the park celebration. Um, and Huey, you've spent a lot of uh, your life um, protecting wilderness areas and, and open space. 
And I'm curious um, about the importance of wildness and wilderness and the natural environment um, uh, left to its own devices to evolve as it will. Um, it's sort of in this context. I would start. Uh, we are talking, when we're talking about wilderness and the shared public themes, heritage. And when we have heritage, that's something that's passed on to generations and it becomes the fiber that a nation exists on, and in time, hopefully, a global condition as well. And what we have in the way of heritage doesn't exist in Europe. These wild lands, the wilderness, natural areas, the kinds of areas that nature conserves and others acquire, have all been disrupted in Europe. What Europe has is another kind of heritage. We love to go and see their cathedrals. I love to go to the Louvre and see their great works of art, or to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and see their great Dutch masters. That's their heritage. Our heritage is this, a very important one, is these remarkable cultural hope diamonds that we have that will grow in value 500 years from now. This nation will look back and the world will look back as seeing these themes as a gift to world culture, just as the Dutch masters, Van Gogh and others, uh, Impressionist eras, are great gifts to world culture today. I see this as a huge, important theme that establishes a value that generations can share and affect the quality of our lives individually. So do you have a position on this sort of economic exploitation of parks in this way? Yes, I disagree with it very much. Well, uh, people love to try to impale economists on the, on the sword that uh, everything has its price. Uh, and in one sense, everything does have its price. Uh, you paid a price to come tonight. You, I don't know why you'd pay this price, because it's a nice night out there. I would have stayed outside if I were you. You paid a price. Is it a dollar value? Can I put a dollar value? I can't put a dollar value on it, but you paid a price. You gave up staying outside in the nice sunshine to come in here and listen. So economists do believe everything is ha has its price, but we don't believe you can necessarily put dollar values on everything. On the other hand, if we don't put, find some way of putting values on things, then they become priceless. And I don't mean of infinite value. I mean we simply don't know what the values are. And that's a real problem. In the case of parks, we have done that. We've said, oh, parks have to be free. They need to be priceless. I think they are priceless in another sense, but we keep the price zero. And the result is, two things. One, they are little doubt. I don't need to tell you people who live closer to Yosemite than I, but I have to live, I happen to live close to Yellowstone. Yellowstone is overcrowded, and it's overcrowded in part because the price is zero. Secondly, because the price is zero, and maybe even more importantly, <laughs> Yellowstone is not only overcrowded, it's underfunded. $19 million for a park as spectacular and as world-class as Yellowstone is is appalling to me in a wealthy society. But if, if we think for one minute that Yellowstone's budget is going to go up a lot in the next 25 years or 50 years by groveling at the feet of senators and congressmen in Washington, we're crazy. And so those of us who love our parks ought to be paying more, I think because it's just, that is to say, I don't think I, as a relatively wealthy person, ought to get to enjoy that park for free. I also don't think relatively poor people ought to be excluded, so I'd be happy to see them let in for free. I think it's just that we pay more. Not only is it just, I think we'll get a better quality product. And so the point about, and, and we've just completed at PERC, a study of state parks. The state parks are beginning to understand they have a resource that people are willing to pay for. A colleague of mine last weekend went to one, and he just went around and he talked to people. Do you mind paying $3 to visit Lewis and Clark Caverns? And they all said, no, it's great. Look at what we're getting. This is a fantastic deal. We drive into Yellowstone. Uh, I've forgotten what the fee will be this year, but it used to be $10 per car load for seven days. That's, Yellowstone collects 30 cents a visitor. For heaven's sakes. I mean, we can make all the arguments on an egalitarian basis that, that, this is, that this is just, but that's absurd because it's not poor people visiting there. Secondly, if we don't put a price on these things, they are not going to be funded. I would be happy to pay a fee as a wilderness person. I probably use it more than most people in this world, in this room. If, if I paid a fee, I would get better attention from the Forest Service. I would get 
better trails, I would get an ecosystem far better management managed if I paid the fee and if that fee stayed with the people, even without privatizing the wilderness. Uh, and I think that's a far better solution. If that's putting a price on it, then let's put a price on wilderness, on Yellowstone, and every one of those precious resources. Otherwise, they will be priceless and they will be treated accordingly. But I think that that's a different issue than the question of whether parks should become sort of Disneyland, Disneyland analogs. But I, I have never argued they ought to become Disneyland analogs. If, in fact, Yellowstone starts charging fees, they're going to, which they already do, they charge for fishing. Fishing's already there. People fish for free in Yellowstone. The first year they charged a fee, they collected $400,000, every penny of which stayed in Yellowstone, and not one fisherman that I know of complained. The sooner they charge more fees, the more revenues they'll have to, to handle fishing. Now, you, you pointed out that in some state parks, which aren't Yellowstones, yeah, they, they uh, lease out uh, uh, pavilions for, for weddings. But those pavilions are there. Why shouldn't we be collecting revenues from them and using those revenues to preserve the resources that are there as well? That's my point. I, well, it's I been mean, an, an interesting issue here in Yosemite because now that it's been um, sort of racked with damages to existing facilities, um, there's many that are arguing, take everything out, let it, let it return to its natural state. Why did we ever have theaters and bowling alleys and that sort of thing in Yosemite, which is a national park? Uh, which allows it to, you know, are certainly profit centers, but... A, a legitimate question, but... I. I those things didn't come from the private sector. Now you can say, oh yeah, they were concessionaires, but look, th this is a national park. <laughs> and we, you let it happen, I let it happen. I mean, that, so I don't, I don't think you can accuse the private sector of being uh, the, the bad guy here. Uh, are, there, do we, are there questions from the audience? <laughs> Alyssa. I have a question for Terry. Um, I have a concern that the free market approach um, how the free market approach would deal with environmental disasters such as the Exxon Valdez oil spill, for instance, and that it's too response-oriented rather than preventative in regulation to do. You, you would have the state of Alaskan fishermen suing Exxon after the fact, after the environment has already been damaged severely rather than preventing such um, disasters. Mm -hmm. How would you address that? Well, first I'll, I'll, I'll just tell a quick story. I was invited once to a meeting of, of the uh, Amico Corporation, and, and at that meeting uh, uh, we watched uh, the, the, the Amico Cadiz. That's, that was the one that cracked off, up off, off the coast of Brittany. And, uh, and somebody got up at the end of this, this video on it, uh, an academic type, and was chastising Amico for this terrible disaster. And I, and I stood up trying to defend Amico and said, well, you know, the important thing is that they're liable for this, and, and, and if they're liable for it, at least they ought to be thinking about what kind of tankers they have and whether their tanker drivers are, are drunk or whatever. They, it wasn't a drunken case in that, in that one. But, so anyway, the person from Amico jumps up and says, oh, wait, 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 we're not liable fully for that. You don't expect that we ought to pay for this, do you? There are limits in international law on the liability with oil spills. And I said, I said huh? I didn't know that. I said, wait a minute, I back away from my case. Again, if there are limits on liability, then we've got the wrong system. I don't think Exxon or anybody else ought to be limited on liability. That's point one. And, and in the case of international law of the sea, they are limited. We ought to get rid of that. Uh, but can you prevent tanker crack-ups? Answer is simply no. Now, can you help reduce the risk? Answer is yes. One thing that would help is to make them liable. Another thing that may help is to say, we need some regulations. Now, I think liability is much better than regulation, but I don't object to regulations in that case. I, I, you know, I, again, you can say, well, should they be triple hauled, quadruple hauled, 17 hauled tankers? I don't know what's the right, I know nothing about tankers, quite frankly, but I mean, those are important questions to ask. So will markets prevent things? No, but nor, nor can government. We can only change the, the risk assessment, and I think, I think important in that calculation is making people liable for costs they impose on others. That will at least change their risk, their assessment of what the risks are. I have a question about privilege for the both of you. If we uh, wish to give... I'm sorry, about... Privilege. Privilege. If we wish, wish to give each of us incentive to care for our own body and mind, we assert, well, that's an individual thing. That body and mind belong to the individual. And if we wish to 
uh, recognize the, the property rights of what somebody makes, that is capital, what they've made, we, we'd say that belongs to them. But the earth itself, the natural resources we're talking about, are actually something, uh, biologically speaking, possible to be uh, individually owned. They are collectively owned. The cost of the environment must be socialized. I'm not speaking of capital, and I'm not speaking of labor. So uh, in order to not confer privilege upon a certain class of people, landholders, what would be your response to a land value tax? That is one that took up entirely the economic rent of location, which we'll call the earth. And then the same question for you, sir. Uh, in nature, there is no command economy. But there is open and free access to habitat, which is finds its analog in economics. In other words, the economics of nature is, in fact, ecology. It's the opportunity for all organisms to access habitat. And I suggest that the same model, that is, taking up the economic value of habitat, is a natural way of socializing something that belongs to all humanity, while not impinging upon the personal property rights of individuals. It provides all of the incentive for society to take care of habitat earth and uh, leaves all of the incentives to take care of individual property rights, the body and mind and capital. So to speak to privilege is the question, which exists in the private ownership of land value. Social stability is critical to a nation's survival. And part of that, it seems to me, is some form of ownership. And one of the old errors we made, and we will correct, I believe, is to point out that as a citizen of this country, you have a share in what would be called the public trust, that you do indeed have some tangible ownership for something. And a start is, if you divide the number of people in the United States into the number of acres of public land, you come out with more than two acres per person. And my two acres, I think, probably would be in Yellowstone. Somebody else's might be Lots elsewhere, forest, grazing lands. But the basic problem here is that no one understands that. These people rioting in East LA don't understand that. They don't understand they have a share in heritage because we have used these economic themes to totally give away the assets of these lands. But we haven't observed that economic theme because we have not socialized the economic rent of land. Economics is not, the co nature continues to exist, we describe it in terms of ecology. The economics of the human experience continue. What is not in place at this time, of course, is the socialized rent of location. I and would, if you don't do that, you do end up with these inequities. An example I'd offer you, if you go to Sweden, in Sweden there are no no trespassing signs. They don't need to buy parks. They don't charge a rent. If you want to go for a hike, you go for a hike. It doesn't make any difference who owns it. That is a way of providing a quality of life enhancement for society without cranking in all kinds of economic charges which costs as much to administer as the charge itself, if not more very often. I, I think what we're talking about is a separate debate for me. I would be glad to so, discuss that with you. I, I'd right. like to have as many uh, opportunity for as many questions as possible. Terry, do you want to respond uh, to that at all? Quick response to the privilege question. I, I, I don't think you can avoid the privilege. I'm more, I'm more worried about privilege that comes with political processes than I am with privilege that comes with private ownership, quite frankly. <laughs> I, I'm very privileged. I live. Uh, in Montana, I am privileged to, to have the health and ability and wealth to enjoy a tremendous amount of wilderness area owned by the United States government, politically operated and politically provided to me at a zero price. Uh, that's a privilege I have. Thank you very much. I appreciate all of your contribution to that privilege. Now, you know, I, I also have a privilege. I happen to own seven and a half acres of land on which I have a little cabin. Uh, now, should you be able to tax away the value of that land? all the value of that land, the, the, you, you could do that, but we have to ask important questions then about what happens to the incentives. If you tax away all the value, let, let's take what some people allege happens with the wilderness or with endangered species. To the extent that, that endangered species regulation taxes away values of land, it changes motivation. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't pretend for a second that all people are out there raping and pillaging trees because of the spotted owl of the red cockaded woodpecker. But some people have, and, and, and that's because we've said we're going to take away some value. And, 
people will respond to that. So I don't, I don't, I'm not sure you could implement such a system without having some significant incentive effects. And at least if you're going to debate the question, that I, I come back to my word. Yeah, ask what the incentives are. I just, I, I'd just like to interject um, some really breathtaking examples to me of people who are making other choices. And one uh, group of people are the Heisla who live up in British Columbia and uh, decided not to sell their forests to paper companies worth millions, billions of dollars um, because this was their heritage and the way that they have lived and their understanding of relationship and ecology uh, took precedent over an economic valuation of that. Similarly, the Mycin people in Papua New Guinea, also very poor people by our standards, uh, have opted not to sell their forests worth anywhere from 500 million to a billion dollars um, to paper companies because they understand that this is fundamentally who they are. So um, I think it's important to recognize that there are other ways of valuing other and, and, and people who see privilege differently. I mean, they see privilege as the privilege of living in a place that their ancestors have always lived. And there is an interesting piece in the paper, I don't remember if it was this morning or yesterday, um, um, about a fight on a small island in Australia where the Aboriginal people do not want to see develop there because it is, development there because it is a, a sacred place to them. It is, it is their heritage. And yet there are developers who have a different view and want to uh, reap some specifically economic dollar benefit from it. I, I'm not going to let myself get impaled on any benefit cost analysis sort. I don't believe in benefit cost analysis. I believe in people doing it. I think that the groups you've talked about have calculated benefits and costs. And they said, you want to offer us billions of dollars? Nah, 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 nah. We're not going to take it. I think that's great. I've been offered far more than I believe my cabin is worth in the market. But I'm not going to sell it because it means a lot to me and my family. That's my value. That's my benefit cost analysis. Hallelujah to every Indian tribe in this country that wants to do that. That's their business. But we hold their land in trust, by the way, with one of the biggest planning agencies in the world, the BIA. We don't let them make a lot of their own decisions. If they want to turn that down, more power to them. But again, it's not a benefit cost calculation done by some economist. It's done by a group of people who have a system. Small groups and Indian tribes in this country are a classic example of small community groups who can get it together if a few of us would leave them alone. Uh, and I, again, just want to point out that the cost-benefit analysis is the language, the rhetoric of, eco of economics in which to talk about it. I don't believe that those people would say that they're using a cost-benefit analysis. And I think that it is very important to understand the connotation and, uh, that is conveyed, the meanings that are conveyed through different language and rhetorical frameworks that we use. So when you use an economic language, you know, you get to inhabit the territory pretty but fully. It's the language of planning. Um, I'm interested in the fact that the environment is not a small nation. I think the United States is a relatively small nation compared to, say, China or India. Um, I think that if you're advocating free market um, and you're advocating wealthier nations, I'm talking to you, uh, Mr. Anderson, if you're advocating wealthier nations and the wealth, wealthier they are, the more they can solve their problems, then what do we do um, when uh, China gets a, a whole lot wealthier, 1.2 billion people? And what do we do when um, uh, India uh, and Africa get a whole lot wealthier? Uh, do you advocate that the free market system would then work with uh, these people who are wanting uh, to um, uh, have cars and build cities and make roads uh, and um, uh, who are sometimes living on the very fringes of their own survival um, and uh, wanting to move up in the world? Uh, how do we deal with, uh, with this on a global issue through a free market idea? I guess I'd say we don't. We can't. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any way that I see we, meaning the United States or the group of us in this room, have a way of going to China and saying, you can't do this. I mean, we, well, we 
I guess if we have enough military clout, we might try it. I certainly don't advocate that. I just don't, I don't see any way that we can, we can communicate with them, and, and, and Huey and I would be right on the same wavelength here. I think to the extent that we have information that says, if you do A, B will happen, we ought to communicate and, and where A is taking some action and B is, is harming, causing some environmental damage. We ought to communicate that as best we can. Short of that, I don't think we have any ability, or in my opinion, any right to, to tell the Chinese what they're going to do. And we, you know, we, could, we, we might try and do it on the basis of, you know, it's our environment too, but I mean, I, I don't know how you do that. But secondly, let me just, just add that all the data point in the same direction. The best air, the best water, the most open space, the best lands, all of it is in the wealthiest countries. I and wonder why, though. Say again? I wonder why. It's because, uh, don't you think the wealthier countries, if we're talking about uh, Europe and we're talking about Japan and we're talking about the United States, um, don't you think that uh, we had something to do with the fact that uh, we, uh, ha that the environmental deg degradation in the so-called third world is so terrible? Absolutely not. I don't agree with that. That's a, probably another debate as well. But, but Huey, I'd be interested in your response to that as well, because do, no matter how much green planning you do in China, there are we are reaching the limits of, uh, of what our environment can tolerate in terms of waste and the way that we're dealing with it. So how, how would you respond to this gentleman's point in, if you were to implement green planning in China and India, for example, but still uh, supporting the kind of development that's going on there, which, by the way, is many. When you say it's not us or we don't have anything to do with it, indeed we do. These are American, American corporations that are that are in large measure responsible for the economic boom in, in these places. I hope that truth wins out. That 1.2 billion times anything is overwhelming. In the book Who Will Feed China, the author mentions that uh, if the Chinese drink two additional bottles of beer a year each to prepare that beer will wipe out the, the Norwegian grain crop. And if they get 100 eggs a year a piece, it will wipe out the Canadian grain crop. And those grain crops are already fully utilized. So I would argue that the Chinese are very aware. And the Chinese currently have Dutch managers going to China, talking to them about how they might put together a green plan. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Captain. Um, Huey, good to see you. I used to work with, with Huey before. Oh, sure. um, and I want to address the, uh, the Dutch model because I'm actually working on a book about that right now, so it's on my mind, sometimes more than I want it to be. Um, this is, I think it's, it's, it's hard to explain, obviously, in a 15-minute you know, presentation or in a debate, but talking about things like command and control, which is a very um, hot topic, or in incentives or cooperation, which are hot topics. But the characterization, I think I'll probably address the question towards Terry, is um, the characterization that I could offer of what the Dutch have done, it's basically um, Roosevelt's good old theory of speak softly but carry a very large stick. And they have had a very strict command control system in that country, as, as in most, you know, as we call Western nations. Um, it costs a lot of money, and its businesses don't like it because it costs a lot of money. What they did was they said, we'll sit down with you and talk about ways to do it a little bit cheaper. We'll give you a little more flexibility on the goals and time frames, which is something actually the businesses actually requested of them. They said, give us a long-term long -term plan so we can plan our investments on this. We'd actually prefer that from government. So they've done that. And they've said, as long as you achieve things, the, achieve the goals, then we'll, we'll hold the stick away from you. But we still have command and control. We still have regulation. And the moment that we don't see that happening, the stick comes back. And I don't think you could ever say that businesses care about the environment or ever give a hoot about the environment. But they do care about um, lowering the um, sort of the transaction costs of dealing with the environment. They know the regulations are there. However, you have to make sure they know the regulations are there. So that's why command and control works. Um, and only in a framework, I believe, of a very big stick of command and control can you start talking about economic incentives and any kind of cooperation. So your comments toward that. And Huey, if you want to jump well, in. Well, my, I guess I, I would just say a, a great example of what you just described, I think, exists in the Tar Pamlico uh, Sound in, in North Carolina. Okay, and it exists in the following way: EPA said you're violating uh, water quality standard, standards in Tar Pamlico, and they went to the point sources of, of pollution and said, "Clean up." And the point sources, namely cities, 
and, and industry all said, good heavens, how can we clean up more? We've already cleaned up a lot, and to clean up more is going to cost millions and millions and billions. And the environmentalists agreed with EPA it ought to be cleaned up. The environmentalists got together based on a command and control standard, got business, municipalities, the environmental community, and agriculture, the big, big uh, polluter in this case, got them together and said, what can we do here? Here, the stand, here in a sense, is the stick. It's not even, you know, it's, it, it's out there in full, full uh, view. What can we do? And the result was that business said, well, if we're going to have to spend the millions that it would take to clean up to meet EPA standards, maybe we'd be better off spending them raising the dikes around big pig farms so that they don't spill over when it rains. They spent much less money and achieved far more uh, environmental quality, water quality in this case, than they would have had they, had they simply had a technology based, this is what you have to do. So, though I'm not a big proponent of regulation, if you're going to have it, I think that's a far better way. Here's a role, back to the NGO question really, here's a role where environmentalists played a very positive uh, role by bringing people together. They were kind of the, the watchdog in a sense for EPA and it worked very well. So. Uh, you know, we can debate whether the regulation was right, whether the water quality standard that was set was right, but I don't think it's debatable what resulted. It was a far better result than you would have gotten without a technology-based standard. So when I've written about uh, regulations of this sort, I've said don't impose technology-based standards. They are really about the worst thing you can do. If you're going to impose standards, put them in a local, as local a basin as you can, and again, if it, you know, you can't have them all this little pot of water here, but if you can localize it, make them local and get the people together in that vicinity and say, fix the problem, do it your way, and you'll get a far better result. So I, I you know, I, I think I'm probably agreeing with you. Gee, that may be dangerous. I would pass in favor of another question. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak or ask you to, to address the issue of a local technological um, command and control system down in the South Coast Air Quality Management District in Los Angeles which has the worst air quality in the country, and they have command and control rules addressing NOx and, and SOx emissions for you know, different industries. And that's the baseline command and control stick. And then there's the carrot, which is to give uh, certain industries that are subject to those rules otherwise an opportunity, like in North Carolina, to meet a ratcheted down uh, level of air emissions um, meeting a performance standards basically which gives industry an opportunity to flexibly, maybe cost effectively, um, go ahead and meet that performance standard which is lower than what they'd have to do under the command and control program. Um, failing that, they revert back to the baseline of the command and control program. So it seems to me that in this debate, here's an opportunity to bridge together a lot of, I think, what both of you are saying, which is um, you have the, the carrot, which is the performance standard, which is um, more ambitious than the command and control. Failing that, you revert to um, what would otherwise have been the government solution in the first place. So if you could both speak to that, I'd appreciate it. Well, I think it's a remarkable accomplishment and uh, that Air District uh, received one of those 15 awards that we received as well. And uh, so we saw them close up and they've had a huge, unbelievable challenge. You've got to take on a huge urban center with these air quality problems and put them into a manageable context and improve the conditions so you can see the mountains again, they deserve the tip of my hat. I think it's a great start. Must be getting white because I probably agree. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it's, a, it's a case where you know, people are, you know, well, if you're so blasted smart with markets, fix this one. I don't have a market solution to that one. I can't bottle up this air and say, ah, got mine. You, know, you polluted it. Pay me off. I, I don't see a good way to solve that now. Given that you can't solve it with markets that I can think of anyway, you can't build fences in the air, uh, then you do what we've done there. And I think we've made, I think that the last Clean Air Act amendments that allowed this stuff to happen are a tremendous stride forward. It's only a shame that it took so darn many years to, ha to have that happen. I mean, economists have been talking about tradable emissions uh, for a long, long time as a way of improving things. Uh, nobody would listen to us because we use benefit cost analysis, I think. <laughs> My name is John Levinson. Uh, one one uh, comment uh, about uh, government uh, and incentive uh, uh, balancing each other. Uh, 
while well, you mentioned dam building in the United States, which Wallace Stegner was very much opposed to, uh, and which uh, uh, as long as the, uh, the uh, Bureau of, Engi of uh, Reclamation and the engineers had the, uh, the bit in their teeth, why they ran with it and they built every dam that they could. On the other hand, um, in, uh, in Los Angeles, the Otises and the Chandlers owned uh, the San Fernando Valley and to assure themselves of a water supply for their real estate development, they bought the Owens Valley and they drained Mono Lake but up to a, a recent uh, NGO uh, activity to get some water back in, in, in uh, Mono Lake. However, the, the point I wish to make is that I think that increasing globalization uh, makes it absolutely essential that governments participate in the process, whatever it is, throughout the world. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, a document, 11-page document, which was uh, issued by the State Department uh, in mid-April called Environmental Diplomacy, which I think reflects uh, a position of the United States government to try to engage in regional um, uh, matters with, uh, with people who are concerned about those various regions. And there are many of them, you know, China being, being one, or East Asia, another being being in the Middle East, uh, it's either water or war between Syria and Israel. Um, uh, you're uncertain about uh, whether we have enough evidence about, uh, about uh, global warming, Mr. Anderson. But the folks in the Pacific Islands don't care if you're certain or not, because if, uh, if it is, in fact, global warming, and if the, the uh, Arctic, uh, Antarctic ice cap does, in fact, melt, why, they've got a two-inch uh, mean high tide level, and they'll be underwater. So we need uh, uh, a global approach to that particular matter of global warming in order to keep part of the citizens of the world above water. And I think there are many other examples of that sort which indicate that uh, governments must become more involved uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the environment along with, uh, with industry and with, uh, with uh, the public population. But I Pick on the global, or pick up on the Mono Lake case first. I, Mono Lake is a, is a great example of what happens when you don't have markets, uh, and and it's a, you're you're right that an NGO was involved, uh, and and you're you know it was what 1983 when the Mono Lake decision was, early 80s anyway. When did we start water flowing back into Mono Lake? Uh, not until last year. Uh, and when it finally happened, it was because that NGO helped broker some water deals to really make it happen. Had it not been for a water market, I would submit we still wouldn't have water flowing into Mono Lake. So hallelujah to, to Tom Graff and the other people at EDF. Uh, you know, I, I've always held them on a pedestal. Uh, with respect to global warming, I, I, I agree that if it's a problem, those, those Pacific Islands will, will uh, face, face some, some, some problems. But if we take on that issue and, uh, and, and we're wrong, then other people are going to face some costs. And you know, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know what that cost-benefit trade-off is. I don't. I'm just saying we, I don't think the jury's in on global warming. And, and to look at it and say, well, if it exists, then we need to take all these actions or there will be costs to these Pacific islands. That's true. But if it doesn't exist and we take the action, then we've imposed a bunch of costs on other people. Uh, we did this with, with ozone. We said, well, and again, I don't think the jury's in on that. But the people who are going to suffer more from ozone than anybody, than from our ozone regulations are going to people, be people who are not going to have refrigeration as soon as they might otherwise have had it. And some people are going to suffer from botulism. Now, I, I can't make that trade-off for you. I, I will not pretend to be the economist who can do that trade-off. We just need to understand that those are the trade-offs. Governments are going to make those trade-offs. They'll probably screw them up, but they have to make them. I don't object to that. Uh, I just hope that when we make them, we do it with, and Huey and I, I think, would agree on this, we do it with the best evidence we can. And in my opinion, and I'm, I haven't read it all, but I think the best evidence suggests that if we're going to go, go take some action on global warming, we ought to move pretty slowly, because I don't think it's going to be a problem. But uh, again, we ought to, I mean, and, and it's not just I who say that. The, the, uh, forget the acronym for the IPAP study, but there are a lot of, you know, they changed a lot of words in that study as a result of scientists saying, don't say this is a foregone conclusion. So you can, you can either act and be wrong or act and be wrong. And both of them have costs. I would like to 
note that politics is a critical issue. We keep talking about government or governments or governments globally or whatever. One of the exciting themes about living in a free society is the fun of politics. And if it isn't the way you want it, then it's your fault. You've got to go out and change it. And that is why mathematical formulas don't work. And when you've got the mothers of a nation being stirred up because a third of the children of the nation are getting a glass of water tomorrow with carcinogens in it because of past misuse of toxics, or you've got a cancer epidemic where uh, mothers are worried about their children's future because of the 60,000 chemicals that are floating around loose in our midst. They're now beginning to be serious indicators of disease problems, genetic problems, and, and uh, other themes. It becomes a real condition where politics can move and will move and can change things. I, on global warming, I would argue the idea of no remorse actions. If you plant more forests, since the United States clear cut our forests and didn't bother to replant them anyway, investing in new forests so that it captures carbon and provides a source for new homes and fruit and whatever else will come from trees and forests, that's a very smart thing to do from a public investment perspective. And it's involved with politics, and that has to be part of the equation, which can include economics. But I really feel that we ignore politics, and we shouldn't. If we have, these, if we have two last questions, quick and very quick responses, we can get them both in. OK, I actually have a question for each of you. Um, Huey, my question for you is uh, related to the way we talk about things and the semantics that we use. And um, we hail sustainability as the latest and greatest in the progressive environmental movement. And um, yet we still denigrate subsistence lifestyles. And I'm wondering if you've given any thought to sustainability versus subsistence. And my question for Terry um, is related to your comment about um, using common law. And I'm wondering, um, doesn't that, as Alyssa pointed out, put us into a reactive mode? And being in that reactive mode, um, that means then that an individual or entity is required to come up with the money for a lawsuit. Um, so we're, there's a money and a time frame issue with um, the common law process. And then another gentleman asked you a question, and I think you responded by saying that you didn't believe that there was a net transfer of wealth from developing countries to the US. So if you could touch on that as well, I'd appreciate it. I would like to uh, read Brutland's definition of sustainability. Fundamentally, sustainable development is a matter of national discipline that Disciplining current cons needs, we, what we need to do is to discipline our current consumption. This sense of intergenerational responsibility is a new political principle, a virtue that must now guide economic growth. The industrial world has already used so much of the planet's resources and damaged so much ecological capital that sustainability in the future, in her view, is essential for future life. As to how we react to, in human society sense, we have some great examples of basic living lightly on the earth conditions. And I would offer Buddhism in Asia as a case in point. That there's not a million, there's a billion Buddhists. And part of their practice and principle is living lightly on the earth. And they do quite an effective job. They have a happy existence, if you visit there in many senses. But they are effectively demonstrating a gentler, better way, potentially, of cutting back on consumption. So we have these actual working examples around us. And uh, I have thought a lot about your point. Can we go to subsistence levels? I don't choose to, but I assume we could. I think that if we manage our affairs and if we assist the developing nations by the Rio conference was really about a carbon tax, the North would Nothing wrong with uh, the world that a $2 a gallon gas tax in the north wouldn't solve. So that we could then fund and assist the use of technologies in China and other nations of the world, which I think we're going to have to do anyway. That's getting another debate in far afield, but I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, common law, reactive or proactive. Uh, I'm pretty careful when I drive my car. And in part, I'm careful because I don't want to get sued. And I'm, I'm very proactive in the way I drive my car. 
so you're right that in one sense common law does not take a proactive political approach, but it's the liability associated with common law that causes people to take a very proactive approach. Montana Power Company, to give one example, when they built the coal-fired generating plants in eastern Montana, put in a three-tiered system for collecting possible seepage out of the fly ash ponds, and under the third put in another collection basin that pumps anything that leaks out back into them. They did that without any single regulatory stick. And when asked why they did it, it was very that was very proactive, and they did it for one reason. Had there been pollution, had it caused problems, it was very clear who was going to be responsible. In England, where streams are privately owned, to take, take uh, on the cost question of bringing these lawsuits, there's an, there's an association called the Anglers Cooperative Association. Belonging to it are pubs, are communities, are wealthy uh, owners of fishing beats, uh, and they sue if water gets polluted. They win cases. They've lost none. Uh, and as a result, people who think about putting stuff into streams in England are very proactive. So is, is the politics proactive? No. Is the person taking the action proactive? I submit yes, and I think it's important. The net transfer of wealth question is one that, again, I'm not going to get into any kind of an empirical measure because I have no idea how you, how would you, how you would measure that. If we demand things from, from some less developed countries, and as a result of that, people say, I'm willing to go to work producing these things. Does it have some impact on their environment? Of course it does. Are they wealthier? In some sense, they are. I don't know how, you, how I would calculate whether the fact that they now have fewer trees and more health care is, is a good or bad trade-off. I think they need to do that. Even if you said they have fewer trees and more automobiles or more television sets or whatever else, I don't know how you make those calculations. I don't pretend to know whether you can say it's worth it. Back to the point, I think that's something they have to decide. We ought to be able to communicate with them, as, as Huey has suggested. But uh, I, don't, I don't think it's clear, one way or the other, whether as a result of our trading with less developed countries, they are better off or worse off. And if, you know, maybe, you, maybe you think that's perfectly clear. And I think you can make it clear by saying, I want to measure whether they're better off or worse off on the basis of, do they have fewer trees? If that's your measure, then you can make a statement. But if you want to measure it and take into account other things, I don't think it's clear at all. Last uh, you're question. shaking your head, so I, I look forward to your measures after the discussion. Last question, and please, uh, we really do value your evaluation, so if you would leave them with us as you're walking out, we'd appreciate it. Uh, a question for Terry. Uh, I wonder if you could give a couple of additional examples that you think best exemplify how the free market uh, has worked to protect the inherent value of natural systems, such as the productivity of soil or the cleansing capacity of wetlands. Because I think the, in, in those types of, of positive contributions to uh, the well-being of humanity, which are, don't easily come down to dollars and cents, uh, they transcend the the tidiness of dollars. And I wonder if you could, if you have some examples like that. And similarly, Huey, I wonder if you could give us some examples where beyond planning, similar uh, attributes could be pointed to in a green planning process where we get to actual results rather than the plan to get to results. Uh, let me, <laughs> I need him to, to uh, put a box around that question. Would you repeat it, please? Just some examples of where the concepts of green planning have actually led to tangible outcomes where the inherent values of natural systems have been increased and improved in terms of their productive capacity of serving the, uh, all the species. Oh. Let me take on the wetlands one in the interest of time. I'd be happy to talk about soils later, but I, I think the wetlands is a tougher one anyway. Uh, I think the, the best example of wetlands is what Ducks Unlimited does and what, more appropriately, what Delta Waterfowl has done. They are both organizations that have collected fees 
from people who like to go out and blast holes in the air in some cases, and in other cases, people who just think, I would like to see more ducks. They've taken that money, and in the case of Delta Waterfowl, a great program they have is called Adopt a Pothole. Uh, they go up into Canada where the best nesting habitat is, where probably, I don't know Canadian agriculture, but I can predict that subsidies to agriculture are, are encouraging people to uh, uh, drain wetlands. That's my bet. I don't, that, that, I don't know. They go up there and they say, we'll adopt a pothole. We'll pay you not to do that. Uh, and we'll come up and survey the ducks uh, that, that nest on that habitat. And that's their measure of whether the quality's improved. And, and you know, is it a good measure? It's probably not the only one, but it, it's, a, it's not a bad one. The person who adopts the pothole actually gets a report, quarterly report of duck, duck production on that pothole. They get pictures of their pothole. Uh, it is an example of a free market at work. Is it going to do everything to save the Mississippi? No, but the best thing to do to save the Mississippi is to use free markets when it comes to agricultural programs. <laughs> if you eliminated subsidies to agriculture and you eliminated the subsidized destruction of wetlands, uh, you and I wouldn't be having this discussion at all. Uh, uh, but I, I think there are some examples uh, of, of how markets have worked. For my question, an example of how natural systems have been enhanced by this application of planning on an integrated, comprehensive, systemic basis. Certainly, I would offer that some Dutch examples. Uh, the Rhine in Holland 10 years ago was unfit for a human to be in. It would be very dangerous. Now, when I was visiting there, standing in their environmental management pod up in the air with in it with uh, automated air quality pickups and water quality dials, I was very uncomfortable because it was like a nuclear management facility to me. And I, kind of get, I asked the manager, what are you doing, really? There were the fire trucks and people in uniforms ready to go out in case there was a spill or a leak. This is the largest harbor in the world that they're overseeing, which is Rotterdam. He said, very simple, we're bringing salmon back to the Rhine and we've succeeded. And uh, so there is a restoration of a massive Central European watershed of great, of great reach. Wouldn't have happened had they not had a comprehensive, integrated theme working with people politically, industries, economically working. Another thing they've done is emphasize electric transit, electric trains, so they get less emissions, get less acid rain, they get less soil pollution, they get less dying forests. These are examples of this remarkable restoration, 